All right. Well, we are live, it seems. So, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. I'd like to welcome you to the WebGL virtual meetup. My name is Damon Hernandez. I'm co-organizer of the SF WebGL meetup that actually just had our 10-year anniversary last month. So super excited about that. Um, I'll be your moderator today for a bunch of amazing speakers that we have from our global community. So thanks for joining us so early or late, depending upon where you are. Um, before we get started, a quick shout out and thanks, of course, to our speakers for joining us uh, today. And of course, the Kronos for their support and all the work that they do to help make this happen. This meetup is being recorded. So, uh, and make sure to ask any questions that you have um, in the Q&A and we will answer them at the end uh, in the Q&A session, time permitting, or as the speakers are able to grab them. So just make sure to, to put that there in the Q&A, depending upon what operating your system on, on, on the bottom. So um, with that, and without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, co-organizer of the Silicon Valley WebGL and WebXR meetup, WebGL working group chair, and all around rock star. Uh, Ken Russell, who will share with us, as usual, the WebGL updates. So, Ken, when you're ready, sir, let's get started. Thank you very much, Damon, as always. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> on behalf of the WebGL Working Group, I'd like to hopefully quickly present you a few updates of the status of WebGL. So keyboard focus was wrong there. Okay, so I've got way too many slides and I'm gonna have to breeze through in order to give time to our uh, awesome presenters. So let's try to go quickly. We, um, we the, the working group tries to scour the internet and find all the awesome uses of WebGL that are out there. And uh, every couple of weeks when we meet, we assemble these big lists of them and send them out to the uh, WebGL developers list, which I would greatly encourage all of you to join and please participate in and please share what you're working on and any questions that you have about you know, how your development is going. All of the browser implementers are, are on that list. We're, we're watching and we want to help you. So please do join, participate, uh, take a look at all the cool stuff that's continually coming out and share your own stuff, your creations and every, all your other findings. Now, one big announcement that we'd like to share is that WebGL2 is finally becoming universally available. In particular, it's coming to iOS. There's been a collaboration with Apple ongoing since June 2019. And the way that this happened was by taking the Angle project that was used originally to make WebGL run on Windows and integrate it into Apple's WebKit en engine as the WebGL backend. Initially, it's going to be targeting OpenGL and e OpenGL ES on their systems. And we're hoping to switch to Angle's brand new Metal backend soon. You can test this right now in Safari Technology Preview on macOS and in Safari in the iOS 14.x betas. We can tell you that it has significantly improved WebGL1 conformance. WebGL2 is passing more than 98% of conformance. And of course, we're aiming for 100%. You can track the project's progress on WebKit's issue tracker. And the big message is that you can rely on availability of WebGL2 essentially everywhere, just like you can uh, with WebGL1 today. So I encourage you to upgrade your applications to WebGL2 and its expanded feature set now. Uh, Jeff Gilbert is unfortunately not here yet from Mozilla. So uh, let me point out I the Firefox. Oh, fantastic. Would you like to speak to this slide? Uh, sure. Um, in Firefox, we're uh, adding, um, I don't want to read off the slide, but we're adding a process sandboxing for WebGL um, that should help with the security um, and uh, it's something we're looking forward to. In particular, even though WebGL is not a big security problem, one of the pro one of the things that this lets us do is it lets us lock down the process that ha controls the um, the JavaScript JIT, so that any problems we have with the JIT, which is a trickier part to get right um, security wise, can no longer like that process no longer has access to the the graphics hardware at all. And that's really exciting. It's a bunch of work. Um, uh, there's should be some performance improvements we get for free for this. Um, there's some regressions we do know about. If you're using Nightly or um, Beta right now in Firefox, uh, 
on Mac or, or Windows, um, you're using it already. It's already on. Uh, let us know if there's anything uh, that you see wrong with it. And um, hopefully it works well. All right. Super, Jeff. Thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, fantastic piece of work. Um, it, Microsoft Edge has been making good progress as well. Uh, their WebXR implementation is now using OVR MultiView by default. It significantly improves content, uh, XR content on the web, it, I think by 50% usually. It, it basically reduces a full rendered pass. Microsoft's also adding support for multiple GPUs to Chromium on Windows. So if you have a, a laptop with dual GPUs, you can finally begin to access the uh, discrete and integrated GPUs separately. So please try out the experimental support uh, as, as listed here. Basis Universal, as you remember, uh, has been released as open source. This, uh, their bino this uh, the product from Binomial LLC offers the advantages of GPU compressed textures with the file size of JPEGs. And the author chooses whether to use medium or high quality depending on file size constraints and what the application requires. They offer a WebAssembly module that works in all browsers and Cronus's KTX2 spec incorporates Basis Universal's technology. There are a couple of uh, links here uh, describing how to use it in both 3JS and GLTF. And WebGL itself now supports the BPTC and RGTC compressed texture formats. Um, this, these are what enable higher quality super compressed textures on the web. The Cronus 3D formats working group is preparing a best practices document on their usage. So please watch for its release and we'll announce it on, for example, the WebGL dev list when it's out. Uh, WebGL via the X Texture Norm 16 extension also now offers higher bit depth textures. This uh, extension is already shipping in Chromium today and coming to other browsers soon. It provides new 16 bit per channel signed and unsigned normalized fixed point render buffer and texture formats compared to, for example, 16-bit floating point textures, which have more range, but less precision. This extension is widely available on drivers and several drive, uh, widely available on devices and several driver bugs have been worked around and reported to the hardware vendors. It's available to mscripten applications and browsers are implementing support for image decoding with 16 bits per channel, for example, uh, high, high range uh, pings. The working group has also been working on improved geometry batching extensions. The multi-draw extension has been previously announced at WebGL meetups and provides some staggering performance improvements if you can and want to take advantage of it. It's a little bit different than instancing. So please check out the examples and the, um, and the extension specification. Two other extensions related to multi-draw, the base vertex base instance families are coming as well. These reduce CPU overhead uh, with static batching scenarios and provide better instancing functionality. And they're available on most desktop and uh, the latest mobile platforms with emulation when necessary. You can test this in Chromium today. It's all, these are also available in mscripten. So please, if your application is doing a lot of draw calls like CAD CAM, like BIM applications, you'll see some examples today. Uh, please give it a shot and see the kind of efficiency improvements that these can offer you. Now, let's talk a little bit about future directions. There were quite a few uh, early questions from the audience about this. You probably have all heard that the WebGPU specification is coming soon from the W3C. And what does this mean for WebGL? We assure you, WebGL will be supported forever. It is an integral part of the web ecosystem. Browsers will continue to maintain and improve WebGL implementations. Performance and quality are the WebGL working group's highest priority and have been in the past. WebGL2 is a viable universal deployment target and graphical apps that need to shift today should target WebGL2. We at the same time encourage you to start developing with the in-progress WebGPU implementations that are in browsers today. I'd say Chrome and Firefox specifically. Babylon JS and 3JS, you know, two of the most popular uh, WebGL libraries, are already making tremendous progress on WebGPU backends. Now, at the same time that WebGL is being supported, browsers are aiming to transition their implementations to maintenance mode. We are aiming for WebGL 104 and 201 conformance 
uh, suite and spec snapshots first. We're aiming to devote less effort to new features and more effort to WebGPU. Customers' requests for the highest priority WebGL extensions, however, will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, WebGPU is being developed by all of the browser vendors at the W3C. The same uh, people that have been working on WebGL are working on WebGPU. And Kronos and the W3C already collaborate closely and will continue to do so. Now, you, you probably know that WebGPU offers a, a high performance API. Uh, it, it, it breaks through the performance ceiling of the OpenGL style APIs. It offers portable GPU compute and an advanced feature set. It also paves the way for feature parity with native platforms. As an example, take a look at Felix Meyer's ray tracing prototype where that uh, feature was integrated into the WebGPU API. The implementers are aiming to integrate with the best of breed native tooling to improve the developer experience. So we're, we're hoping to make it easier for you as developers to shift over to uh, WebGPU and take full advantage of it. Future meetups are likely to cover both WebGL and WebGPU. This is the, the 3D on the web ecosystem and we wanna bring you all the latest information and, uh, and talk with everybody as opposed to segregating the community. And everyone is welcome to participate with a quick click through agreement in the W3C's WebGP community group. And we would love to see you there. So with that, we have an awesome group of presenters today uh, please ask your questions on the chat and we will, uh, I think, batch them up likely and answer them live at the end of the session. And with that, let me please uh, hand back to either Damon or Will. I'm not quite sure who's going to uh, speak. Yeah, Play we'll Canvas. go ahead and um, get Will from Play Canvas. My favorite open source engine since 2014. So Will, when you're ready, sir. Hey, can you see that? We can see you and hear you and you're good to go. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm released. Really I'm super excited to be here to give you a 2020 update about Play Canvas. So I'd like to start by going over some of the key um, engine runtime updates that we've made recently. Um, the first being a uh, the addition of day code support to our standard materials. So if you're anybody that's doing any High fidelity vehicle rendering in WebGL, then um, this will be uh, of interest to you. We've also updated our morph target support. So previously, we were limited to like four or eight morph targets, depending on whether you were using normals or not. So we've reduced that, uh, we've removed that restriction now. So here you can see a model that has 52 morph targets and they can be rendered simultaneously. And we're doing this by um, putting the morph deltas into floating point textures uh, and then blending those on the GPU. We also uh, have a PR lined up. Uh, so this is in preview. It's support for area lights, courtesy of Mark London at uh, Kuva. Um, so it's looking great. I'm really excited to see this get integrated into the engine and then into the Play Canvas editor. Uh, we've also added full WebXR integration into, into the Play Canvas engine. So we've exposed APIs to handle hands, light estimation, AR hit tests, and everything else that you find in the WebXR spec. And a nice side effect of our integration is that you get free um, integration with our UI system. So you can create um, 3D user interface components, and then they just automatically work with um, AR and VR ray tests. Uh, we have integration with uh, cloth simulation now. So if you're looking to do any cloth simulation, uh, we've got something that you can reuse. It's based on anode.js um, and it gives really good performance on, on mobile as well. Um, so check out that open source technology. Now I want to get on to some of the tools updates that we've made uh, recently. Uh, so these concern the editor application that we have. Um, and the first thing we've open sourced something called PCUI. PCUI is uh, user interface components built for tools developers. Um, and it's actually the foundation of the Play Canvas editor. So essentially we've open sourced the front end framework of the editor. 
Um, so um, you can use it to build your own tools. Uh, we've used it to build um, this, this GLTF viewer, which has been open sourced. Uh, it's built on TypeScript. It's 100% GLTF 2.0 compliant. Um, so you can head over to GitHub and port that code, or if you need to view any uh, GLTF content, um, it's a good option for that. Uh, we've also added, uh, added um, FBX to GLB conversion uh, for your Play Canvas projects. So when you drag an FBX in there, you get a GLB, you can drag that into the 3D viewport and um, view all of the materials, uh, edit all of the materials. And we've integrated the GLTF viewer into the Play Canvas editor. So um, you can right click on any GLTF file, open it in the viewer, you'll keep that to the viewer. And then you can use the viewer's features to tweak lighting, view stats, view wireframes, and so on. <clears throat> We've also integrated basis texture compression into the editor. Um, so here you have four uh, textures in the asset panel. So if I just select those four images, you can see there are 2K textures, uh, 4.8 megabytes of PNG data. So if I scroll down to basis compress those, I just have to enable basis, pick a quality, import the basis transcoder, and then just hit compress. And the editor will go away and it will use basis U to compress those images. Um, but it's pretty cool because it auto detects normal maps and it will do a different encoding for normal maps uh, to avoid channel leakage and you get much better quality. And all of this is done by default. So with all of those bases encoded, uh, you can see it's reduced from 4.8 meg down to just 800K utilizing just 11 meg of VRAM. So this is gonna make a huge difference to you if you're um, using a lot of texture data. Another big feature release we've done recently is um, templates. Now, if you're a Unity user, you'll know templates are something called prefabs. What you can do is select anything in your scene, turn it into a template, and then you can just uh, instantiate that template anywhere in your hierarchy. So you can build lots of duplicates of like, certain models here. So you can see a bunch of towers being created. And I can modify one of these towers to have a different uh, top. So I can view the diff, I can see that it's changed, and then apply that difference to all of the instance uh, templates all around the scene. Uh, and I can drag these templates directly into the hierarchy to rapidly construct my scene. Now, from day one, uh, we've added a really, really useful feature, which is to be able to create nested templates. Uh, and, and what that allows you to do is drag templates within template instances. Um, so you can create like very complex structures of reusable, uh, re reusable parts of hierarchy. Um, and the last thing to say is that um, if you want to do any template instantiation in code, uh, you can just like apply these templates to your scripts and then just like dynamically create them at runtime. Now, creating this templates feature has enabled us to build something really cool, which is when you import an FBX file now, um, instead of just getting a blob representing a model, you now get Model, uh, model template asset. And if I drag that into my 3D view, I can uh, select certain parts of that model and you can see the entire hierarchy. So I can make any transformation to any component in that 3D model. I can add components like lights and cameras and particle systems without having to write a single line of code. Something else I want to show you is a uh, preview of our animation state graph editor. So this is uh, like creating animation state transitions with no code. So I can create an idle state and create a jump state. And once my computer is slowing down a bit. Okay, uh, it's not great. There we go. Um, so yeah, like I can create a transition from the idle state to the jump state and um, then I can create a condition that controls when I go from idle to jump. So I'm going to create a trigger. And I'm going to hook that trigger up to the button in the running application. Okay, and the only other thing I have to do is create a transition from jump back to idle. So when the trigger fires, I'm going to go from idle to jump, and then it's going to fall back to idle. So here we go. Idle, 
to jump back to idle. Okay, next. So I just want to finish up by showing some play canvas content. So I picked a few pieces to show you. The first being um, a promotional site created by a company called uh, Visionaries 777. Um, promotional site that allows you to explore a futuristic city and then play a marketing game. And the next thing I want to show you is Venge.io, which is a um, uh, it's an objective-based first-person shooter. Um, so this is just a regular browser game, uh, and it's hugely popular right now. So it's just smashed through three and a half million monthly active users. It's got 5K concurrent users, and uh, yeah, so definitely check that out for some uh, really quality browser game action. And I have to finish this uh, talk just by. Uh, referencing Snap Games, Snapchat's gaming platform that's powered by play cameras. It's got over 100 million players, and um, there's a ton of games that you can play within Snapchat um, if you want to uh, see some really quality HTML5 gameplay. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. And so up next, we have um, a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart coming from the built environment in WebGL. So we have Rami Santina. So Rami with a blacksmith saw. So when you're ready, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Damon. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Okay, so my name is Rami Santina. I'm gonna talk about construction. So, yeah. So let me first start uh, by reducing this one here. Okay, so why, why in construction and why do we exist? So in a late study that's shown for the labor productivity growth in the construction, you can see with the line on the bottom that construction lags behind the total economy. And in the study, it shows as well that if we raise the productivity to the economy average, there's a $1.6 trillion opportunity there. So Maximusoft is built by construction expert for the construction industry. As we understand that the construction industry is a conservative industry, and uh, buying into new technology is hard, so you need assistance to it. So at Blessing Soft, we focus on people and technology at the same time. So our strategy is we don't enforce, we ask to buy in by having a modular system. So there is no need to transition all your operations directly from day one, and it's adaptable, customizable to company operational workflow. By that, we know because uh, all co construction companies are not alike. So each company has a way of working, a way of doing things that they are accustomed to. So we uh, integrate into their operation workflow. And so we provide all this uh, cutting edge technology with modules and features. But also we understand that the number one tool in the construction industry is Excel. That's why we have two-way integration with Excel as well, because a lot of people like Excel. So with COVID-19 and the global pandemic that's been hitting us, we have seen a, a large requirement for remote work. So that came into an increase in buy-in for cloud. And because we are uh, able to have a local cloud service provider uh, deploy deploy our system on it. So we have the transition uh, quickly for a lot of our customers. Uh, I'm showing here two screenshots from our system. The one on the right shows the buyer report, which is instead of site visits, because currently like uh, people can't go to directly to site and see what's going on uh, or fly over. So here he can, uh, the buyer can see the 3D model and the BIM model in this case, 
and it will show what's the current status on site with the current activities and all the important KPIs. And you can change the date to any future date to see what's the planned finish of any activity. And on the left, uh, we see our virtual daily operations planning board, which is uh, becoming instead of in-person meeting. So we have a huge buy-in to cloud uh, technology. So here, each card is like pouring concrete or something on one column. So it's like a trial board, Kanban board, but for uh, construction. Okay, so I'm gonna jump directly into renovation, which I'm gonna focus for this presentation. So what we have here, we, we integrated uh, point clouds and uh, laser scanning into our application to be able to handle renovation better. So in this image here, I'm showing an old building. It's a historic building that's been destroyed. And you can see that from uh, your office or your home, you can go into the model and check all the details and take all the measurements here. I'm checking the angle to see if uh, this wall, and you see that it's 178 degrees. So it's uh, about to fall. So it's not safe because also the engineers cannot go on top here on the floor because uh, this building is about to fall. So you can do your study from anywhere like on the cloud and take exact measurements to identify all the uh, elements needed for change. I'm gonna show a use case. I'm gonna show it in the demo as well. It's uh, rebuilding after the Beirut blast on August 4. There was a huge blast in Beirut uh, that uh, left half of the city in the station. So in the description, you see why the cloud is needed. The contractor is a German company. The architect for this building is a French company and the donor who is paying for the rebuilding of this building is an EU-based foundation, can't name it. And the building is just 800 meters from blast center. So the requirements from the donor was he needed a full documentation, proof of the damage, proof of progress, and proof of all the quantities. So images are not enough because you can take for the same uh, window, multiple images from different angles and say all the windows in the building are broken. So you need a fraud proof cloud solution. That's why we went into laser scanning. So we did the, so provide laser scan for the whole building and the amount of data that this generates is like around 11 gigs per floor. So in this image here, I'm showing you like, you can see here the, uh, the column, which is, this is an aluminum steel column. It's very heavy duty that it's bent. So you can imagine the power of the blast. So they can exactly take measurements of all the items and to decide what needs to replace, what can be fixed on site. And, and we are able to provide this by using a lot of technologies in the backend from GTF to FGL to Draco. And uh, of course, uh, Autodesk Forge to, uh, to visualize the BIM model. So let me jump directly into, uh, sorry. Here we go. All right. So here I'm going to show a live project that just started. Uh, so I can see here I have a task that's uh, called Windows Procurement. So here you're they're just purchasing the procurement. And I can see here that I have the model, the 3D model with the BIM, sorry, uh, the 3D model. And uh, with it, uh, you can see my screen, right? I guess so. <laughs> okay. So if I go in inside the 3D model, I can navigate, I can see the point cloud, uh, which is the laser scan on top aligned with the BIM model. And I can see like for this case, they're, uh, they're using it before actually uh, starting the reconstruction and they already see the benefit of it because the BIM model that they have is not up to date. Uh, somebody changed the balcony here. And uh, yeah, so I guess I have uh, two minutes more. So I'm gonna do it quickly. Okay, so let me turn off all the BIM objects and show you only the, the point cloud. 
So what we have here, you can take measurements. So for example, if, okay, I'm, this is a procurement of windows. So I'm gonna uh, take a measurement of the window and I don't understand decimal feet. <laughs> so I'm gonna switch it to meters. So I can see exactly how, how much uh, distance is this and I can verify it with the, my progressible objects which are automatically linked to the 3D models. So I see here all the, and the uh, rule of credit. By rule of credit, we mean how we measure uh, progress, which is defined by project to project and all the constraints before to start the work. So cleaning up the debris and it's open and the issue is linked directly to BIM 360 issue management, which have a whole workflow with it. So, and you can see all the material takeoff needed, which you can verify directly with the point cloud and the BIM model. And also the readiness checklist, which is uh, uh, from experience, what needs to be done to be able to do it. And also the documents required. And once he's happy and they can generate the worksheet, uh, if they want uh, not to use directly the system, they can directly generate the worksheet and use that on site actually uh i guess um on time yeah <laughs> i can show more but uh, yeah okay perfect thank you so much rami uh for that uh, presentation showing us uh, there what blacksmithsoft is doing and staying on the theme of uh the built environment we're going to go ahead and move over to Lindsay k from zeo labs who's going to share with us a little bit of how he's using a webgl for building information model and, and other uh, built environment related data so Lindsay, we can see your screen and so when you're ready the floor is yours. okay cool thanks uh so i'd like to talk about um zeo kit which is a, a javascript library i've made to basically accelerate the development of custom viewers for BIM and engineering model visualization. Uh, just I'll just start with what is BIM? It's a it's basically digitized construction management centered around a meta model provided by the industry foundation classes, and we can use BIM models to collaborate uh, at all stages of the construction process. The challenges of of visualizing BIM models on the web are include the standard ones, loading large models quickly, fitting them in browser memory, and drawing many objects interactively. But it also includes a couple of extra ones. Um, the big one would be being able to accurately render full precision BIM models on WebGL, which um, due to it, uh, GPUs normally only supporting single precision arithmetic to around, I think, seven decimal places, you tend to get a lot of rounding errors when viewing those full precision models without any sort of uh, emulation when rendering. And another little challenge is how to move the camera around in a, in a BIM model, which often contains sort of wide open spaces and very tight spaces. So you can't just move the camera at the same rate all the time. You've got to adapt the speed of your camera to uh, how much detail you're looking at and how tight the spaces that you're moving in. So what's CO kit? Uh, JavaScript SDK uh, uses WebGL1, uh, specializes in loading uh, large-ish BIM models, IFC models, and rendering them at uh, precision in most browsers. And it, it des it's designed to give you the, the power to do it all yourself so that you can use open source conversion tools to convert your IFC models for consumption into ZeoKit. And you can host and uh, convert your models on your own servers. So how does ZeoKit load big models quickly? Well, it loads a few different file formats, including GLTF and OBJ and STL and, and 3D XML, but it also has its own native binary geometry format called XKT. Um, this compresses the geometry by uh, quantizing it, but it also partitions the objects up into uh, tiles and makes their vertex positions relative to the center of the tiles. Uh, this allows those vertex positions to be single precision and then are further quantized, of course. And so we get 48 bits per position and 16 bits per normal. 
Um, the XKT format also contains some pre-computed um, indices for wireframe views. And these are a little bit expensive to compute, so they're pre-computed in the XKT format. Now, here's, here's an overview of the pipeline for converting files for ZeoKit. And we're using two open source tools from the community there, IFC Convert and Collider to GLTF. And then we're converting the GLTF to XKT using a ZeoKit converter tool. And at the same time, we're also extracting metadata from the IFC file. And now we have those two files, geometry and metadata, and we load them into ZeoKit. And there's a link there to a wiki page on details for that. So here's a bit of source code showing how we create a viewer and a loader plugin, set the camera and load the geometry. So ZeoKit's designed to be quick to start with. It's got a lot of training wheels and defaults built into it. And this helps document it as well. So we can have really minimal examples. Oh, I'll just, oh yeah, on to the next slide. So, uh, minimizing memory footprint, squeezing those models into browser memory. Um, the first thing we do is we don't store geometry in browser memory, we store it on in the GPU. Um, that's because we don't really need it in browser memory because all our ray picking is pretty much supported by the GPU. So we don't really need mesh geometry in memory in the browser. Uh, and we don't really want to do things like collision detection in the browser. That's more, more of a server-side process. ZeoKit's the presentation layer. So, and there's, a, there's an example of a big model uh, at BIMDATA.io uh, who are using ZeoKit. And that's loading a really big plumbing system there. I think there's a, maybe a couple of hundred thousand objects there. I'm not really sure how big that. So to draw many objects interactively, ZeoKit's using two techniques, um, angle instance arrays, which is pretty standard in WebGL world, but also something a little less common, batch geometry arrays. And for this, what we do is for every object that has its own unique geometry, we bake that geometry into world space and then, and then uh, concatenate it all into the same set of VBOs, which we can draw with one draw call. So this is nothing new. This is a pretty old technique. Um, we're also including in those VBOs um, an array of vertex flags, which we use to uh, cull objects in the vertex shader. Um, each object has a set of flags, which is you know, replicated for every vertex, and that's a VBO, but it's not as bad as it sounds. And we can dynamically show and hide objects by um, writing to those VBOs. And in the vertex shader, um, we discard a visible object by setting all its um, vertex positions to zero, zero, zero. And accurate rendering, here we go. Here's an example of, of jittering on WebGL. This is basically where the, where the geometry is rounding to the nearest available single precision values. And this typically happens with models um, that are centered far from the origin, where their global coordinates are consequently really huge. And the way ZeoKit deals with this here is, uh, here's a, a model, the same model in ZeoKit, using tiled relative to center coordinates, um, which like I mentioned, are 32-bit offsets from their 64-bit tile centers. And as we render each tile, we modify the view matrix to render those geometries relative to the eye. Um, if you want to read more about that, have a look at uh, the link there, Virtual Globe Book, 3D des Engine Design for Virtual Globes, because there's a whole chapter on it in there. Oh, and another benefit of relative center coordinates is, yeah, like I just mentioned, um, full precision without the cost of storing double precision values because we're storing single precision values for all of the positions. Navigating precisely. So in ZeoKit, we deal with this by continually firing a ray every in, or every in frames to find the distance to the nearest object along this line of sight and then scaling the dolly and zoom rates accordingly. And 
an example of Zeo Kid in the Wild. Uh, recently, Open Project, um, I worked with Open Project to integrate Zeo Kit into their project management system. This is the world's most popular Open Project management software. And they have sponsored the development of a standalone viewer, um, which we've integrated into Open Project. And I'm just going to run a YouTube clip here. Uh, just this shows a, a subset of CO kit functionality. And so we can do things like you know, X ray and select objects. And using the IFC metadata, we can build this explorer tree and isolate stories. And switch into plan views. And slicing planes. We're going to continue to build this viewer up over the next few months. Okay, I think my talk has gone very quickly. And that's everything I've got. Thanks a lot. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for uh, showing us that. And I just dropped uh, a link to that YouTube video there in the chat. So if folks want to go back and take a look at that, uh, go ahead. And um, so up next, we have uh, definitely my favorite uh, 3D library of all, and probably one of the largest in the world now. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Alban from Sketchfab to come and share with us about the amazing work that they're doing over there for quite some time now. So um, we can see your screen, sir. When you're ready, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. <coughs> I'm Alban, the co-founder and CEO <coughs> sorry, of Sketchfab. Super happy to uh, be here today and present the latest and greatest uh, from Sketchfab. So for those who are uh, not familiar with Sketchfab, um, our Goal and mission is to make 3D accessible. We want to provide the best place to publish 3D content and also provide the best place to find and download 3D content. Uh, so first, a uh, quick company milestone. We just passed 4 million uh, users, community members. And I think it took us almost a year to get to 6,000 users. And now we have over 6,000 signups every day. Um, and it's nice to see that. Eight years later, it's it's uh, it's actually it keeps accelerating, uh, which is really nice to see. Uh, the main thing we've been working on for the past month and pretty much the past year is Sketchfab for Teams. The idea, our mission being to make 3D accessible. We were initially focused on content creators, uh, with the goal to help them share their pretty creations to the world thanks to the web and WebGL. And we realized there was the exact same need within companies with 3D content being super siloed and essentially 3D designers being the only ones having access to 3D visualization solutions and otherwise sharing like screenshots and videos to, to the rest of the team. And so Sketchfab for Teams is essentially your own Sketchfab for your organization, uh, whether you're a company or a school, uh, a class and so on. At least you essentially invite uh, people to your account. And so you get to invite coworkers or colleague. Uh, you get to uh, to pick uh, permissions. So are you a spectator, a contrib contributor, administrator, and so on. And then you essentially get a content management system uh, with the core feature being the Sketchfab uh, player that lets you uh, view all your models in, in full 3D glory. Uh, you get to inspect uh, inspect the content uh, pretty fully and it's been uh, very well received uh, by typically by brands during covid who are shifting from physical samples uh, to uh, virtual samples and and using this new feature to essentially share designs uh, with the team and so yeah you can think of it a bit like a, a google drive for for the 3d world 
another uh, uh, big feature for us uh, has been USDZ file conversion. You may remember that we were launching partner of USDZ when Apple announced it in 2018. And uh, the format mature, it took, a, uh, it took us a bit of time to, to get to work on this, but now any file you upload to Sketchfab is automatically converted to USDZ, which means that any model on Sketchfab can be downloaded either uh, on its original format, uh, and we support more than 30 formats and inputs, or in GLTF or USDZ. And this allowed us to ship app-free AR support. Uh, and so now we support uh, native AR straight from the embeddable player. Uh, and so if you are on desktop, uh, you're going to see a little AR button that's going to prompt a, a QR code. And then if you're on mobile, it's going to jump into straight into AR uh, on both iOS and Android. And what's nice is that uh, we've adapted our web-based VR editor to also be an AR editor. And so it's really the, the fastest way to uh, kind of scale an object for AR. And so whatever you change uh, in the scene here uh, in terms of scale and position and so on is gonna apply to uh, the native file uh, on Sketchfab. We've also finally uh, switched from uh, WebVR to WebXR support. Uh, and so here is a, a quick demo of uh, Sketchfab running uh, on the Oculus Quest 2. I haven't tried myself yet, but it seems to be running pretty smoothly, uh, which is nice to see. We've also expanded the things you could do with our viewer API. And uh, more and more companies have been using uh, Sketchfab to build more advanced experiences, typically configurators. Uh, and so here's a, a quick demo. So this is our, our viewer uh, live embedded on the Yamaha website. And so you can see a, a very nice uh, model, uh, beautifully rendered and running pretty smoothly. I think it's 600,000 polys and, um, and it's still running pretty smoothly there. We can do things uh, like changing uh, colors, uh, which is nice and easy. But then you can uh, do things like pick and add equipments on the fly on the bike and essentially design your, your dream bike. Uh, you can see on the right side that it's uh, updating the, the pricing in, in real time. Uh, and yeah, this has been uh, getting more and more uh, traction by our uh, customers. And then last but not least, I guess you've seen uh, uh, the LiDAR coming to the latest generation of iPhones. And this is something I've been uh, personally super excited about, and I've been waiting for this to happen for the past pretty much eight years. And we are already natively integrated as a sharing feature with uh, many of the capture apps. And I've been playing with this every day ever since. And so just to show you a few examples, uh, we just announced today our integration with Polycam, uh, which is really great to share, um, to scan like uh, places and scenes. And so here's a, a little building you can see the, the textures are, are really nice. And this was scanned in literally um, a minute and then it's processed in maybe like 30 seconds uh, all on the device. Another uh, great app is 3D Scanner app, uh, which is pretty great for more like smaller things and more detailed uh, things. And so this was scanned in literally five seconds, like just, uh, just scrolling through the table with my iPhone. And you can see it did a really great job at at capturing this cake and, and saving this moment. And then uh, just a third app, which is pretty cool, Record 3D, uh, which is an app that lets you capture uh, animated content. And so this is my son uh, on a swing. And so here I posed, uh, I posed the model just to show you. So this is a succession of, of point clouds all displayed together, one point cloud per frame. Um, and it's, I just love, love how it it renders and I find it extremely uh, graphical and you are essentially able to uh, yeah, decompose a video and have like full six degrees of freedom uh, within a, a volumetric uh, video, which is really cool. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Alvin, for sharing with us uh, what you have going on over there at Sketchfab. And definitely uh, make sure to check that out, upload your models and, and take advantage of all those cool features. So up next, uh, we have um, someone who knows how to take us all the way from 3D printing to AR. So uh, Emmett uh, Lalish with a small little company called Google. Sir, the floor is yours. Share with us when you're ready. 
Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I'll be uh, presenting on uh, Google's Model Viewer project. Um, maybe a big company, but small team. Um, so Model Viewer, um, what we're really here to do is, I mean, you know, along the lines of what Sketchfab does, but much less and much simpler. Um, it's just get interactive 3D rendering in one line of HTML. So anyone can put this on their website. Um, you can see an example line here at the bottom of the slide. Um, you know, we're an open source web component. And the idea here, um, you know, we take GLTF as our standard input format because of the, the standardized uh, PBR rendering that we now have in a 3D format, which is spectacular. But what GLTF always talks about is that, you know, they're trying to be the JPEG of 3D models. Well, it's fantastic, but what makes a JPEG so powerful on the web is that we have an image tag. And you can just say image source equals, here's your JPEG image and you know it will show up everywhere and it will work everywhere. And traditionally with WebGL and such, that is certainly possible, but I wouldn't say it is easy. Model Viewer is here to make it easy. Um, that's, that's really the whole point is it's meant to be that sort of equivalent of the image tag, but for 3D models. Um, so we bring physically based rendering to as many devices as possible. Um, we're here wrapping the 3GS library, which of course is in turn wrapping WebGL. Uh, we also wrap WebXR. The idea being that instead of these things being the purview of graphics experts who understand vector algebra, which probably most of you actually do, but the rest of the world does not, <laughs> um, we're, we're here for the rest of the world, right? We're here for, for people to be able to put this stuff on without having to think about a lot of math. Um, so, you know, we've got a, an expanding list of partners. Um, one of the big ones, of course, is Shopify, who's rolled us out to a lot of their merchant websites now. Um, NASA also shows off lots of, uh, you know, rovers and planets and such. Um, Visible Body has all kinds of um, beautiful um, animated models of the musculoskeletal systems for education and such, um, all using Model Viewer. But another thing that we do is we're a gateway to augmented reality. Um, I actually work on the Chrome WebXR team. Those are my coworkers. So a really big part of this is making sure that WebXR is also really easy to use and easy to deploy. Because um, like WebGL, it's a pretty low level API at the end of the day. Um, so of course, you know, we can launch the same uh, native AR viewers on iOS, Android, right? You know, Quick Look, you can add a USDZ file so that Quick Look is able to do an AR experience. Uh, likewise, Scene Viewer um, will go ahead and open on Android, which is a very similar kind of app. And those are great, but they're separate apps. They're outside of the web browser. You're having to intent out to these things. Um, that gives you very little control over the experience that's happening as a web developer. WebXR is here to make this much better. And we're really excited now that WebXR is out for Chrome Android um, along with DOM overlay. What that means is now the experience that you're seeing on the right here is actually possible really easily because we can now append any DOM from your HTML right into your AR experience, the same as your 3D experience. And that's really what this video is demonstrating. We have here, for instance, a model picker um, at the bottom that's there on your regular 3D web page. But when you enter AR, it's still there. You can add extra DOM content to demonstrate to the user how to move their phone around. Um, you can do anything that you need there. And you then have the same complete control with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript over exactly how that experience is going to go and how you're going to hook things together. And that can be seamless whether your user is in AR or in 3D. Now, this is um, a, this DOM customization is a, is a big deal because it's it's not just about AR, right? It's also the fact that you can now make simple user experiences that are quite complicated if you want them to be. Um, again, just using the power of, of HTML, right? So you can put whatever HTML elements you want here. You've got CSS. And since you've got JavaScript, this means that now you can easily build something like a style button that says, oh, I'm going to swap out the textures on this shoe, pick a different variation, right? And all of this UX that we're familiar with building websites for is now going to work naturally um, for both 3D and AR.
um, and you get this consistency. We even surface an AR status attribute, and that makes sure that you can style your CSS according to what phase of the AR experience your user is in, um, and also allows you to take whatever kinds of um, uh, data you need on, on how they're using your experience. So the other thing that we do is, you know, we're bringing physically based rendering to the most devices possible. A really big part of Model Viewer is broad compatibility. We support IE11. It's not fun, but we do it. <laughs> um, you know, we can even support down to our, our WebGL1. Um, so we can work on the most mobile devices that are out there. We require absolutely minimal extensions. Um, and this is, again, just for, for the broadest device compatibility. Um, I actually built a, a novel environment lighting strategy to help make this happen. You know, so part of this is uh, we do just-in-time pre-filtering for our uh, environment maps. Um, it's now faster than the GPU upload. So you don't have to worry about doing these things offline. You don't have to worry about the uh, formats of these internal things changing. Um, you know that an HDR equal rectangular image will give you the lighting you expect. Um, we don't require floating point texture extensions for doing this. Um, so again, you know, supporting lots of devices. And even if you have a really extreme HDR image like this one with the sun in the sky with tremendous contrast ratio, we still handle that naturally. You don't have to like manually scrub out the sun and put in a directional light or something like that to, to, to approximate it. Um, so we, we compare well to other real-time renderers um, despite being built for very low-end devices. Um, and you're welcome to take a look at these links to see for yourself. Um, rendering performance, obviously, is also really important to us, given that we're targeting a lot of these low-end devices. Um, so uh, we have a single shared WebGL context. So no matter how many model viewer elements you put on your on your page, you don't have to worry about running out of contexts. You know, they're sharing shaders, they're sharing caches, making sure that things are um, efficiently using GPU memory. Um, these things only render when they need to. Um, it even avoids the copy uh, if there's only a single model viewer element visible on the page. Uh, it really helps performance, especially in browsers like Firefox. Um, we do dynamic render scaling, so we're able to maintain the frame rate um, by dropping the resolution if we need to, because again, like the, the frame rate is really what people notice, right? And if they can handle it being a little bit blurry while it's moving, so of course, as soon as it stops, it'll pop back to full res. So. Um, that kind of dynamic render scaling, we're actually working right now on getting into the WebXR standards so that we can do the same thing in AR. Um, and again, you know, performance is critical, right? And it's not just about rendering performance. That's kind of what we think about as, as WebGL users. But at the end of the day, we're a web component. And what really matters on websites, shopping websites and such, you know, the reason that Chrome pushes these Lighthouse scores is because we've found that this is really what users care about, right? If they come to a page and it just stops for a couple of seconds before they can see anything, if it's janky, right, they might not even stop to look at your model. So um, making sure that the page loading is really good um, is critical for us. You know, So as a web component, we pay a lot of attention to our size. We're only 199 kilobytes um, as a MinZip library. You can, uh, just by deferring the model loading, um, you can manage a 93% uh, or 93 on, on a mobile performance score in, in Lighthouse. You can also, we've got an example, quite easily defer loading the entire library um, and even put up a seamless poster image during that period. And you can easily get 100 score um, across the board. So um, this, is, you know, this is important for us. And we're going to really make sure to continue focusing on these scores as, as we evolve to make sure that the idea of adding a 3D model to your website shouldn't be any more troubling than adding a JPEG to your website. Um, and of course, we've actually got a little editor now. It's very simple compared to some of the ones you've seen earlier. Um, but it does really ease the process of creating seamless poster images. Um, and it's also capable of outputting an entire model viewer snippet, a snippet of HTML that you can simply, after customizing your situation in your model, simply copy that snippet directly into your website. Um, and again, the whole point of this is just to make 3D easy, make it so that it's available to the purview of non-experts. Now, of course, as we look to the future, um, I'm involved, of course, with the uh, GLTF Kronos group. Um, so the PBR Next extensions are pretty exciting, doing a lot of work to basically get realistic rendering from a wider range of materials. And that's going to be exciting for everyone. Um, 
realistically more of that work is probably going to happen in our underlying library 3.js than directly in model viewer but um, we're certainly going to be keeping an eye on it and making sure that we can build these things performantly across a wide range of devices not just the most modern gpus um, we're also consistently expanding our scene graph api this is the kind of thing that allows you to swap out textures um, on materials and such um, it would, we're really looking eventually to get into the possibility of multiple model placement, especially in AR. We've had a lot of requests for this. Maybe you wanna place multiple items of furniture in your living room and arrange things. Um, so I think that's gonna be a really interesting direction down the road. And then of course, we're, the WebXR um, APIs are constantly evolving to keep up with technology and we're um, busy keeping up as as soon as they're shipped. So as I say, the viewport scaling is coming in here soon for performance. Um, there's also gonna be dynamic lighting estimation coming before long. Um, they're working on depth estimation, especially exciting with the uh, iPhone 12's fancy depth camera. Um, I hope, hope that someday they support WebXR because I would love to have access to that kind of depth data. But maybe we'll also start to see those sensors on other phones in the meanwhile. So, that's all for my presentation, but uh, I encourage you to go to modelviewer.dev. Uh, you can find all the information there. Uh, we actually recently redid this page to have a better uh, docs and examples website there for you. Um, you can find most of the examples you've seen in this presentation. Of course, you can also follow us on Twitter. Um, we've got a Spectrum chat where you can ask questions, and of course, the GitHub issues, as always. Um, so I appreciate your time, and uh, feel free to throw questions into the Q&A. Thanks. Thanks so much, Emmett, for that great presentation and for empowering all of us that want to use uh, AR and whatnot. And, and as Emmett said, uh, make sure I'll please do drop your questions in the Q&A section, not in the chat. Um, if they're in the chat, they won't be seen. So we definitely want to make sure that the uh, panelists know to address your questions. And so up next, we have uh, Ib Green. Um, from unfolded.ai, who's going to share with us some of the cool work that's being done um, with biz.gl. So, Eve, when you're ready. Um... Yes. Here. And as some folks can see, we uh, are answering questions um, over in the Q&A as well. Right. So, so we can see your screen if uh, whenever okay, you're ready. Good. So, <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, so uh, I've been uh, presenting uh, <clears throat> the last couple of years in uh, this um, uh, WebGL um, uh, Birds of a Feather on the uh, uh, VisGL frameworks, and uh, the it says it's a suite of uh, uh, open uh, source and actually <clears throat> open governance uh, uh, geospatial WebGL frameworks that um, <clears throat> have been developed. Uh, we've been working on developing since uh, 2015, and um, these have been developed uh, at Uber and since about a year ago. Um, we, <clears throat> the tech leads of um, three of these frameworks, Kepler, DEC, and H3, we, we basically come together and <clears throat> created a new company, Unfolded. And we built uh, a product, Unfolded Studio, uh, on top of this. So this kind of, in some sense, we regard as, as kind of an, an open core. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you the, um, uh, the product, Open Studio, which is essentially Kind of a super-powered Kepler GL with a, an analytics backend. If you uh, are familiar with Kepler, um, just uh, talking about these frameworks, uh, uh, we have a geospatial um, hierarchical grid system called H3, which is hexagonal, which has very desirable analytic properties that we use for geospatial indexing and unification. We have a rendering engine that's called the Deck GL, focused on geospatial rendering. And we have uh, also uh, Kepler GL, which is an open source application for uh, geospatial analytics. Um, and um, these are um, these frameworks are now um, uh, under uh, uh, open governance through the uh, uh, Urban Computing Foundation, which is part of the Linux Foundation. So. 
uh, it's possible to join and um, you're certainly welcome to uh, engage if you're interested in um, using or uh, influencing or participating. We have a really good uh, cross-industry adoption on these frameworks. So basically the who's who of geospatial software companies are either fully adopting or uh, doing uh, strong integrations. We have uh, S3 uh, integrations, Kato integration, Google Maps integration, Mapbox, and um, also Google Earth Engine. We even have a DirectGL native uh, component developed in partnership with Google Earth. So uh, it's very easy to get started with DeckGL almost regardless of which environment you're working on. Um, I, um, so, so Unfolded Studio itself, it's basically a tool for <clears throat> fast WebGL based, uh, browser based exploration of million road geospatial data sets. And um, it's available. Uh, there is a very extensive community tier uh, for, uh, you know, if, if people want to try it out and studio.unfolded.ai. And um, this is how it looks. It's uh, uh, basically a client-side exploration tool that's very heavily GPU powered, but not only for rendering, but also for computation and aggregation. Um, and uh, we're gonna look at, uh, uh, it deals with very large data sets and it also deals uh, very crucially with the time component which is uh, maybe not so traditionally um, strong in GIS applications. We tend to be somewhat static. And um, it also does uh, on the fly analytics. So you have uh, very responsive as you kind of uh, uh, change parameters, data will, even very large data sets will be updated uh, immediately. And um, So, all right. So, yeah, this is examples of the uh, layer catalog we have. We're very focused on high quality visuals, as you can see. Um, we can handle almost all major geospatial data formats. Uh, we have point, arcs, paths, uh, uh, administrative boundaries, vector tiles, raster, uh, various types of uh, discrete global grids, such as H3, even complete scene graphs. So, GLTF scene graphs can be also be loaded and instantiated in visualizations. Uh, it's a Photoshop like uh, UI, uh, and uh, you can use multiple channels or, or columns to encode the visuals in your uh, in your data. One of the uh, things that we really, by pushing the compute capabilities of WebGL, that we're able to do, that uh, we're you know particularly excited about, is the real-time data filtering, and so um, having a GPU-based um, um, uh, cross filtering of very large data sets where you can filter both in time you can filter in space by doing the spatial selections and we can also filter by it in charts uh, is um, um, a, a very nice feature for analytics we have uh, also using the gpu we use on the fly analytics so you can uh, dynamically integrate into various types of grids hexagonal grids square grids uh, we can do various types of clustering um, and it's fully 3D enabled. And as you change the parameters, data, even very large million point, uh, million row data sets, uh, re-aggregate at, uh, at high frame rates. Um, and one of the main focus for us, as I as mentioned, is the spatial temp temporal analytics. So dealing with the uh, time, we can filter on time, we can animate. We have layers where if you have a time component, the paths are automatically animated. And also uh, the ability to do temporal joins. We um, have an extensive support for tile-based data sources. Uh, we're focusing right now on accessing very large cloud-optimized GeoTIFF formatted library. There are petabyte size uh, archives, public archives up on AVS. And these are multi-channel high bit depth data textures uh, where we do uh, on-the-fly real-time uh, um, analytics on, on high bit depth data. So. Um, we're also traditionally uh, DECGL has been um, for uh, basically projected maps, uh, but we DECGL has added a new globe uh, mode, and obviously we're taking advantage of that for uh, also for uh, for these visualizations. And uh, yeah, we'll have uh, the traditional 
data analytics thoughts. So I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, how this tool actually looks and so you can see, can you see my screen? Yes, you can. So we have uh, um, maps. So, so this is Unfolded Studio when you come and you have your data obviously in the cloud. Uh, you have all your maps, you have all your data sets. And so um, there's an easy way to get started. We have a number of uh, sample maps that you can uh, engage with. I'm going to show some of those for in interest of speed. Um, and, uh, this thing is so this is a, uh, a, a sample data set. We call it uh, <laughs> a, a Lego version of New York. And it's very simple. We've taken uh, all the elevations of buildings in New York and we've run uh, an aggregation into an H3 hexagonal grid. And uh, now we can see an, an extruded map of, um, of elevations. And, and here we have real-time filtering and I don't know how fast it comes across in, uh, it's, uh, it's a really good frame rate. Uh, so you have this possibility to uh, filter and cross-filter data uh, very fluidly. Uh, even though this is a 150,000 row uh, data set. If we look at one of the other examples, we have a, uh, basically a, a dot here for every 1,000 people in the United States. And uh, again, you can cross filter here. We have different uh, categories. Um, this is uh, age 65 and over. And uh, you can uh, obviously filter here. And as, as you filter here, you can even uh, uh, see how uh, the um, the kind of profile and, and uh, distributions are automatically recalculated across uh, all metrics. So um, then another thing we can look at is um, so this is one of our this is our data partner SafeGraph. They have uh, data sets that. Uh, show basically the pattern of how visits visitors to businesses and so here we have uh, one layer which uh, shows the business locations and uh, here we have another layer which uh, uh, basically shows visits to those uh, um, and we can see then uh, using an arc layer here where do the visitors come from so it's quite interesting to see in the bay area um, that uh, distribution of of it is visitors across the country. And um, we uh, go, then the final piece that I want to show is the um, uh, the Landsat. Here we have our raster data. So let's see if we get that working. Yes. So this is uh, from it's a it's a 10 petabyte um, uh, cloud optimized GeoTIFF archive at uh, ABS, and we have servers that automatically demosaic the raw. Uh, satellite data, and this is high bit depth data that's being sent down. So uh, we're building out the uh, advanced analytics of, of this data. And here, uh, satellites have many bands. You can easily uh, change and visualize uh, the various uh, frequencies that the <clears throat> satellites are photographing in. We also have um, uh, commercial support for commercial options, like uh, this is Planet, they have CubeSats. So this is their public data in, in Oregon they, <clears throat> with higher resolution and, and very frequent uh, uh, updates. So um, that is basically the end of what I had to show. Awesome. Thank you so much there, Ib, for sharing with us the great work that you're doing uh, with biz.gl. And don't forget to check out the website uh, unfolded.ai. Um, also, uh, this is being recorded. So uh, for folks that are joining us a little bit late, uh, don't uh, make sure to, to join. Uh, it's in the chat there, chronos.org events, virtual web GL meetup. And so up next and uh, closing us out, we have Jason Carter, who's um, the tech evangelist over at Microsoft for Babylon.js. So uh, Jason, when you're ready, sir, just share your screen. Okay, can you guys see this okay? All right, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to come present. Uh, Babylon JS, we're gonna go over kind of what's new with Babylon today. 
Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with Babylon JS, it is a completely open source uh, game and rendering engine. Uh, it's built entirely in the web. It's a JavaScript library that more or less sits on top of uh, WebGL just to make it a little bit easier to create 3D experiences uh, all inside of the web. Uh, so the big news with Babylon JS is actually last week we were super, super fortunate to be able to share uh, release version 4.2 with the community. And we called it Simplicity Reimagined. And the main reason for this is we looked across the entire Babylon library and said, there are a bunch of places that we could make the development process quite a bit easier by adding tooling. Uh, and so we actually added a ton of tools to Babylon. In fact, most people are telling us we should have called this Babylon 5, but we weren't quite ready to, to claim that just yet. Uh, and so essentially, um, I'm going to go over a bunch of those features So uh, today. Um, again, we released this last week on the 12th. Um, I won't uh, show these today, but there is a, a release blog and a release video that you can check out when you get these slides later. Uh, but just giving you a little bit of an overview uh, of kind of the things that we added. Uh, we added a particle editor. So uh, Babylon has a really robust particle system, uh, but it did require a lot of lines of code to be able to uh, utilize it before. Uh, and now we've built this right into the inspector. The inspector is a, a small pane that allows you to get basically a scene hierarchy and tons of properties about all of the 3D information in your scene. So built right into the inspector, you can now right click to create a particle system, dial in, tweak and adjust those particles all inside of this inspector. And then you can save it to the Babylon snippet server. That's basically just a small server that we maintain to store JSON objects that you can use for Babylon. And then finally, you can load that back into your, uh, your project with one single line of code. So what used to take you 16, 17, 18 lines of code to get your particle system up and going now can be done in just one with a little bit of creation tool. We did the exact same thing with sprites, uh, literally the exact same thing, built it right into the inspector. So now you can have full control of creating in a sprite manager and a sprite system, loading in your sprites, dialing in them and tweaking them and just calling them with one line of code. Uh, we also have a new skeleton viewer. So we know that um, debugging, rigging, and skinning problems can be a little bit problematic, especially when you're going between 3D packages. So we wanted to make sure that you had the ability to see how your bones, joints, and skin weights were all operating inside of the engine. So again, built into the inspector are some debug modes uh, for those exact things. We also have a new texture inspector. Now this is a tool that allows you to debug uh, texture uh, issues that you might uh, encounter or you might wanna you know, investigate within your scene. It has a live connection to the actual Babylon scene so you can uh, make changes onto your texture and it will update live in the scene. Uh, you can zoom into the pixel level, view individual color channels uh, of your textures. And then we've got a few simple markup tools. And actually um, the probably the most powerful and most popular part of this so far is the ability to view cube maps and different LOD MIP maps. Um, so I'm actually gonna show a very, very quick demo of this. Let me um, hop over to that real quick. So I have a very, very simple scene here that's just some uh, a height terrain with a couple of metallic pills in it. And uh, I also have an environment in here that the uh, metallic pills are reflecting. And so I'm gonna open up the inspector that you can see here on the right-hand side. I'll go to textures, grab that cube map, and uh, I'm gonna hit edit. And I believe now I'm gonna have to pop over and share a different screen because this popped out. So let me give me one second here. Okay. And this is the texture inspector. And so now we're loading up the different cube maps. You can see all six sides of the cube map here. Uh, you can zoom into individual pixel level so you can actually get uh, RGBA information on the individual pixels. And then uh, as I mentioned, perhaps one of the most uh, popular features here is the ability to um, view the different LODs, the different uh, levels uh, of the MIP map. So, uh, which is super, super exciting. Um, so let me pop back. That's our new texture inspector. Um, we uh, also added in, this is probably the most asked for feature in Babylon is if you're familiar with the node material editor, this is kind of like our version of shader graph that you might find in Unity. It's a node-based system that you can connect up nodes to be able to, to write GLSL shaders um, that are of course used in the engine. Uh, we were asked to, to include uh, support for PBR metallic roughness. And so we now have that uh, and we've released that to the community, which has been uh, very, very well received. Um, so full support for that. And then um, the node material editor itself has actually been extended to not just create materials or shaders, but to be able to do a number of different things. So this is such a popular tool that we expanded it to be able to create different shaders for individual particles. 
Uh, so you can now have scene awareness to your particles and shade them um, in all kinds of different crazy fun ways. Uh, you can create post process effects, which are effects that are on top of the entire scene. Uh, that's actually what you're seeing in the image here is a post process effect. And then uh, the ability to create procedural textures. And so I'm actually gonna pop back over again to show you um, a demo of this working. So back to our little pill scene here. Um, what I have is a simple scene where I can uh, click on a pill and you'll see a green selection circle. The way that's working is there is a light that is being that is right above each pill and every time I click on a pill I'm repositioning that light and that light is actually projecting a texture. So I thought it would be fun if we popped over to create a procedural texture to make that little selection circle uh, slightly more interesting. So to do that what I'm going to do is go check out this brand new uh, procedural uh, texture creator in the node material editor. That's what we're looking at here. And I'm going to do this super fast and show you a couple of features in the process. Uh, essentially, I'm going to start with the first feature here is the ability to uh, create custom frames. Essentially, these are node groups, right? So previously created node groups that you can now save uh, and bring in in our node menu here and just drag them out, which is super, super handy. So I'll just go create a very, very simple procedural texture that gives us a little bit more life into um, that selection. I can drag out some variables here to create speed, uh, where this is going to be for an animation of some rings you'll see in a second. And then we'll make that. Uh, and then we'll just hook this right up so you can kind of see what we're dealing with here. Uh, so there we go, just a simple, simple procedural texture. And then just to give that just slightly more interesting look, I'll drag out two more nodes and we'll connect this up. So let's um, make this, let's give this some Christmas colors. It's, it's Christmas music is playing in my house already. So we'll celebrate with some, some Christmas colors here. And uh, we'll pipe that into this scale node. And now we'll end out our fragment shader here. And that is our colored procedural texture. So now what I can do is I can hit save as a unique URL which will give us this unique snippet uh, bit of code. So that's an ID to the specific JSON object for uh, this shader or this procedural texture. So I'm gonna hop back into my scene here and I'm just gonna make a couple of very, very quick adjustments. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is show you the brand new playground snippets in Babylon. So this allows me to hit control space. And if you're familiar with VS code, this will look very familiar. These are common bits of code that you may just wanna click and add right in. So I'm gonna do this load node material from snippet. I'm gonna paste in my snippet ID, and then I'm going to do a couple of modifications to our scene. So we'll create a procedural texture variable. Now node material is what's being passed in from the promise here. And then I'll create a procedural texture. I'm gonna give it a size, pass in the scene, and then let's get rid of our green circle. And then we'll pass in our uh, interaction logic into this promise as well. And just because we wanna make this look a little nicer, we'll do that. And then if I hit play, if I've done this right, we should see, there we go, our procedural texture now being drawn to kind of draw your eye to what's selected. So that essentially is the new procedural um, uh, texture creator in the node material editor. And then just to go back real quick and finish off a couple of other quick things that are in it. We do have uh, Babylon React Native. Um, we announced Babylon Native, which is the ability to take Babylon JS code and then uh, uh, create native applications with it. Well, as you can imagine, Babylon React Native takes the best of React Native, the best of Babylon Native and smashes those two together, together to create a really truly amazing transformer. Uh, and then we've also added a ton of other things which we don't want to go into here. All new documentation, complete and updated support for WebXR and all the goodies there, including hand tracking, hit testing, everything. Uh, uh, support for KTX and Basis U, soft transparent shadows. You can have 10x more instancing power with Babylon 4.2, updated uh, GLTF extensions, and a ton more. And then I'll just end it back off with uh, uh, another nod to go check out the full details in the uh, blog post and check out our release video. And uh, yeah, I'll stop there, hand it back over to Damon. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jason. And, um, and of course, all of our speakers. And so now we're going to um, go ahead and uh, open it up for Q&A. So I'll ask uh, that the uh, speakers go ahead and unmute. And we're just gonna start at the top and then run down. So uh, this first one, it looks like is uh, for Will. So in Will's presentation, how is the material of the robe created? Is Young's modulus or Poisson's equation used to create material apparel movement? Uh, so <clears throat> uh, I wasn't the person that implemented this demo, uh, but uh, we just used ammo.js to 
uh, simulate the class. So it's a soft body. So in the demo, we create a soft body dynamics world and Ammo completely manages that body. And all we do is we just track the, track the control points. Uh, and I believe we just, um, uh, the control points are just driving a skin to mesh. Um, so yeah, it's, we don't do uh, the complicated maths that's done by Ammo, we just do the rendering. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next question from Andres. Uh, currently WASM modules need to call out to JavaScript to call WebGL Web GPU APIs. Are there any ongoing plans for browser implementations to shortcut API calls from WASM modules for efficiency? Uh, so this is Ken, I think I can take this, uh, speaking on behalf of other people that are working on it. Um, there are multiple uh, standardization directions for this. Uh, web, sorry, WebAssembly is itself working on a, a new way to specify imports into the WASM environment that are basically C callouts that wouldn't go through um, JavaScript necessarily. At the same time, browsers are also optimizing the callouts from JavaScript to the browser. Um, Firefox already does a, a very good job of this. Chrome has had some performance bottlenecks in this area for a while, and this is actively being worked on in Chrome. So eventually what you're gonna see is the inner loops of your WebGL and WebGPU apps just get much, much faster as they're written in JavaScript today. And as a consequence, callouts from WASM uh, through even the JavaScript trampolines will get a lot faster. So please stay tuned for more on this. Awesome. Thank you there, Ken. And um, so up next, uh, this looks like uh, a team view question. Um, I think this will elaborate on the just-in-time pre filtering in Model Viewer. We'll link to some extra reading. Sure thing. Yeah. So um, at, actually, if you look at my presentation, which I think are posted or will be, um, I do have a link on that slide um, that goes to my blog post, which has a link to the paper I wrote on it. So you can find all the details there. Um, but the basic idea is that um, the basic idea is that most pre-filtering is done as a initial step, um, an offline step that takes quite a while because it's doing a, a pretty complicated and very accurate convolution. Um, and what I figured out was that since those those convolutions are actually stored in mitmaps, you have more error just coming from the linear mitmap interpolation than it makes sense that there's no real reason to have a super accurate convolution at that point. Um, so I made a much simpler and much faster convolution based on a Gaussian blur. And because of that was able to do the whole thing in, you know, like maybe 13 milliseconds on uh, the devices I've been testing on anyway. So fast enough that it just doesn't really matter and you can do it on the fly. Awesome. And then just a couple more questions for you. Um, uh, how do you detect the performance of model viewer from uh, Utaka? Sure, yeah. So the performance, we're basically just timing our uh, RAF callbacks. Um, and the trick there, of course, is that we can't maintain a, a 30 or 60 FPS frame rate that way. Um, but basically what we detect is like, well, if it drops below some threshold under that, then we start reducing re rendering resolution and we sort of target a, a value a little bit under. So maybe, you know, 25 FPS or, or 45 or something if you're at 60. Um, and then we can basically scale up and down depending on how much headroom we see that we have. And then basically once we get back to full, once we detect that we're going back at full frame rate or the model's not moving, then we just jump it back up to full resolution. Perfect, and then um, just a couple more questions uh, for you before we jump uh, further down. Um, does this work on Chrome for both Android and iOS? Uh, yes, it works. Um, so, I mean, Model Viewer is a web component, right? So it works on all the browsers, on all the devices. Um, what matters sort of for uh, compatibility is what you're dealing with for AR. Um, this is why we're really excited about WebXR as a standard, because once WebXR is adopted by all of the mobile browsers, then we won't have to worry about this ever again, right? It'll be just like using WebGL. You'll have exactly the same experience everywhere. We're not quite there yet. We've got WebXR on Android. That's our default. Um, but on iOS, which obviously is a major platform, uh, the only way to do AR at the moment is Quick Look, which is their native application. It only reads a USDZ file. So the experience is a little disjointed there, but we make it as smooth as we can. Um, of course, we also support Scene Viewer on, uh, on the native Android as well, which is very similar. That's where we started. Um, but since WebXR is now deployed, uh, we, we've switched that to the default. 
Perfect. So, um, so then now we're going to jump over uh, for a Babylon question. Um, what is the process for creating post-processing effects uh, that require intermediate rendering targets, like Bloom, for example? I'll actually uh, pass this one over to Gary, uh, my colleague, to answer this guy. He'd probably do a better job than I could. Gary, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I'm trying to find the question. Where is this question? Um, it's it's going to be in the Q&A. Yeah. Uh, it's probably about a uh, few down. And just for everyone else, um, we will look to uh, address any questions uh, that were not answered and the ones that were answered and post that on the Meetup page as well. So if we don't get to your question, we'll uh, hear. We'll definitely make sure we get to it and share with you. Yeah, this one, uh, I think we can probably look in the documentation. I'll try and find a link and uh, answer it over here. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So then just another uh, one, um, is it possible to create custom force equations in Babylon's uh, physics engine and also hand tracking API exposes finger data? Uh, yes, to both. So uh, you can absolutely add your own physics engine into Babylon and completely mess with and change. We use uh, basically a bunch of open source physics engines that you can leverage, Canon, Oimo, Am uh, Ammo, uh, and you can add your own. And so they're extendable They're uh, You can make your own custom one. And then for uh, um, hand tracking, uh, yes, I, I believe so. We can confirm this, but I believe that the finger data, all of it is all exposed and available to you. Okay, perfect. And then um, our last question um, before we uh, start uh, the polling, um, and I'm just going to scroll here, and there's a lot of great questions. So again, uh, sorry for that. Um, so this one is for Emmett. Uh, does this viewer use filament? Sure thing. Yeah, so we do not use filament. I do work closely with the filament team. In fact, when I was uh, doing that pre-filtering, um, I actually upstreamed a certain amount of the research I did there to improve filaments rendering as well as 3JSs. Uh, we all work together quite a bit. But keep in mind, Filament is not actually the only Google renderer. Um, 3JS, right, its founder maintainer, Mr. Doob, is also my coworker in Chrome. Um, and that's part of the reason we're based on 3JS. Um, Filament is a fantastic renderer, but it's first and foremost a native renderer. Um, they did build a Filament JS uh, WASM module for online. But the simple fact is, it's nowhere near as compact a library as 3JS is. Um, and it's also not supported on as many devices, um, being that, for instance, it only works on WebGL 2. Um, so you know, the, the WebGL 1 support is, is part of what's what's done this. But also, you know, things like IE 11 support and such are, are just a lot trickier with that library. Um, and you know, we keep close track of the work that they're doing and try to upstream that same stuff into 3JS. Obviously, we keep track of Babylon 2. And we, we compare all of those renderers on our on our render comparison site that's that's publicly available. You can find the link in my presentation. Um, so we basically try to maintain uh, the level of PBR quality. And there's a chance, you know, maybe someday we'd switch to the filament renderer, but 3GS is meeting our needs really well right now. It's very compact. Let's see, are there any other questions? I feel like I lost the moderator. Uh, the polling. So. It does look like we might have lost Damon. That's uh, surprising. Um, if nobody else from Kronos wants to jump in, then I would like to uh, thank everyone for attending today and thank all the presenters. This was just awesome. Just an absolutely fantastic uh, set of uh, information and, and inspiring stuff about the WebGL community. So thank you all for participating today. Um, we will archive the written Q&A. We will answer questions that haven't been answered yet and uh, publish those. Uh, this, will be, this has been recorded and will be published. Uh, and please do fill out the poll and let us know how this went for you and uh, what we can do to improve in the future. And I think with that, we'll uh, wish you a good rest of your day, afternoon, or evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, that's all. Thanks, guys.